Today's sermon is entitled, The Journey is Real. I know most of you are used to the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah, but the journey is real. I want to talk about the journey being real. I want to talk about the power of the first. Say that with me. The power of the first. One more time. The power of the first. All right. Acts 14 is where we're going to be looking. We're going to be sitting and parking today. We're going to go through some stuff. Let's see if I can watch the clock here. The journey is real. That is the title of our sermon today. The journey is real. Um, journey in the defining sense of the word is uh, the act of traveling from one place to another. So um, getting from point A to point B is real. If we just transpose the definition of the word there, the journey is the act of traveling from one place to another. So when we talk about the power of the first, we may be talking about the power of your first journey. Ah, you'll see where I'm going. The journey is most real when it's your first time. I'll say that again. The journey is most real when it's your first time. The first time you go to Maui, uh, the first time you go to school, it, it's, it's different, follow me now. The first time you get married, should be your last time, but uh, the Lord is gracious. Uh, the first time you go to the new job, the first time you meet your soulmate, there's something about the first time that gives uh, some sort of lasting effect or a different experience than the subsequent times. Have you ever done something for the first time and found yourself a little bit apprehensive? The first time doing something has challenges that we don't expect. The first time comes with experiences and situations that we are not always prepared for. There are dynamics to the first time, unlike any other time you do the same things. I'm going to say that again. There are dynamics to the first time that are unlike any other time you do the same things. Ah, watch what I'm saying. We tend to learn more the first time than we are as comfortable experiencing the moment. Don't get confused with that. All I'm saying is that we tend to be learning more on the first time than we can actually enjoy the experience. So you don't really enjoy Enjoy the experience because you're still learning the experience. And why is that the case? Because it's your first time. Ah, stay with me. The next time is always more structured and it is more organized and you're ready for what is to come. So these things prepare you for your subsequent experiences. But that first experience will never happen if you don't go do it. Uh, remember, the first journey does not happen unless you go to do it. Well, what are we talking about this year? We we're talking about being people of action. People of action should have a myriad of firsts in their lives that people of action ought to be doing things, new things all the time because you're a person of action. And people of action have a lot of firsts. Firsts happen for many reasons, but they are always happening. Firsts are how we grow and expand. You will never matriculate to another grade in school if you don't take the new class. You have to take the new experience. You have to embark upon the new journey. And there are these experiences of firsts that often we are afraid of. But without firsts, 
we never really complete anything, right? Because an end has to first have a beginning. Are you tracking with me this morning? So the first must occur before there is the second. Just like the first man, Adam, who came in scripture, Jesus was the last Adam. There was no Adam subsequent to Adam if the first Adam didn't come. This was the situation then of Paul and Barnabas. Paul had been converted on the road to Damascus we're going to find ourselves in Acts 14, and this is after Acts chapter 9, where Paul had been converted on the road to Damascus. He was called and everything by God. He was commissioned to reach the Gentiles. Um, and we passed chapter 10, where uh, Cornelius met Peter, and Peter introduced the gospel to the Gentiles. And remember, Acts is about getting the gospel to people who were not Jews, that it is the acts of the apostle and the apostles had to take journeys into areas they had never gone before, that this was all a message to the Jews. And so now we have this slew of firsts, that Acts is a book of firsts, first experiences with the Gentiles, first experiences in a new city, first experiences being beaten and stoned with, with rocks. Paul was like, so I was like, man, when I was living my life, I wasn't getting beaten until I got saved and I started getting stoned and run out of cities. So this is Paul's experience and he finds himself in Acts 14 on his first missionary journey. Can you say that with me? His first missionary journey. And he learns, this is it, this is it, Shana. He learns that the journey is real. <laughs> what was, what is it though that is the twist in all of this? Many people don't commit to first often because of opposition. People don't do things, people don't start things because of their fear of the opposition. But today we're going to learn that opposition is a given in everything. I'm gonna say that again, Tony, that opposition is a given in everything. And if you're making decisions based on your opposition, then you're going to be afraid of everything because opposition can be found in every situation. Success and opposition live in the same house. I like that one, Terry. Success and opposition live in the same house. They roommates, just like me and my brother. We had the bunk beds. He slept, I slept on top, he slept on the bottom. But there are two other things that should scare you from starting or continuing with something. Stay tuned and I'll tell you what they are. Listen, let's see what we can glean from today's passage that will help us be better people of action better people of firsts. Let's take a look at Acts 14. In verse one of Acts chapter 14, the text says, now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews. And so this they are referring to Paul and Barnabas. It happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of, here it is, the Jews and the Greeks believed. So here's what we notice first about this text on his first missionary journey that they went to Iconium. We'll talk about that in just a second. But here's what we know, that Paul wasn't alone, that he went with Barnabas to preach in the synagogue. This gives us an inclination to help us understand that when we embark on firsts, we should not embark on firsts alone. Because why? You're unfamiliar. You don't know a lot about it. And that's why parents often try to hover over their kids when they have their first school experience. You've seen the commercials of mothers who have their first first child who they have everything they have all kind of help support books and all that by the time they get the third child they're like baby i ain't read it come on now get get on in this car they don't do all that because they've learned things 
So first should be done with someone to help you navigate through the unfamiliarity of things because what I want you to understand is that the journey is real. And what I mean by real, I mean that it comes with, when you say the struggle is real, it means you're feeling the impact of it. It means that you are um, experiencing something that maybe you did not expect. So the journeys in your life are real, especially when they are first. Now, here's the other thing we learn that they targeted this place on purpose, that they went to Iconium. Why did they go to Iconium? We'll talk about that in a second, because they were both Jews and Gentiles there. We're targeting where we're going. In other words, your journey needs to have an intention. If you're gonna do something for the first time, do it and mean it. Make sure it has meaning and significance. Oh, this is good teaching, and I haven't even gotten started. Note there, it was both Jews and Gentiles present, not Jews only. Why would Paul and Barnabas go only to the Jews? If the commission was clear, take my gospel to the world, reach the Gentiles. Paul specifically was called to preach to the Gentiles. Peter was called to preach to the Jews. And so if you know that that's your calling, if you know you're going to be a dancer, then go to school for dancing. In other words, be intentional on your journey. If you know you don't want to be married to a firefighter because you can't sleep at night, you don't know if he's going to come home, don't date a firefighter. In other words, take your journeys where your purpose is. Oh, that's a good one. Take your journey where your purpose lies. So let's take a look then at this next slide when we talk about Iconium. Let's take our first trip to Iconium, but why? And I want us to make clear that we go to places for a reason. We pick first trips for a reason. And in this case, they went because Iconium, number one, was well watered. It was productive. It was wealthy. It was a wealthy region. In other words, Iconium had something that they could benefit from there. God, why do we keep going to places that don't have what we need? Oh, I'm teaching today. It was the capital of Lyconia. And so we'll learn about Lyconia later that these were cities. Iconium was under Lyconia. Uh, and Lystra and Derby. We'll talk about that a little later. But they went there because it was the capital of Lyconia. In other words, they went to the main hub of the place, which would branch them, connect them to the subsequent cities. Number three, it was a Phrygian region, meaning that there was a Phrygian religion. It was uh, that they were worshiping non uh, uh, monotheistic gods. Uh, they were worshiping uh, a mother goddess. And so it was of a Phrygian background in the Middle East there. And so this was not the territory of the Jewish God. And so you must go somewhere where there is a need for what you have. Go to a new place to introduce new things to the new place. Ah, God, this is so good. I hope you're taking notes. They were going to the Phrygian place, the place where the religion was different from what they had, and they were going to impact that area. And then lastly, uh, they went there because they worshiped the mother goddess there, and they had to introduce this new god. Now, what we must understand is that new territories often scare us because we don't know what will happen. And many of us are afraid even to go to places that are well-watered, wealthy, have plenty of benefits. We won't go to a place that's good for us because we're afraid of the journey that will take us there. Oh my God. It is not always the destination that causes us to be fearful. It is the process in which we go through to get there. In other words, you don't want to drive or you're afraid of flying. In other words, if you could get to that place just by your miracle, you would be fine with it. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't give us perfect marriages. He doesn't give us automatic happy homes. He doesn't 
wouldn't give us big fat PHAT bank accounts. We have to go through a process. And what does that mean? The journey is real. So it must mean that the journey means something to God, that God gives us journeys for purpose. And so if you don't have any firsts this year, Oh my gosh, you're missing out on what God has to share with you in those journeys. But here's the first thing I think Paul is teaching us about our first journey. I think what he's saying is, number one, focus on the journey, not the challenges it could expose. Focus on the journey, not the challenges it could expose. So just going through those texts, we go through those texts, and this is our first meaning that we get, our first point, that we are to focus on the journey, not the challenges it could expose. Well, why? Because of number two. When something is new, not everyone is on board. When something is new, not everyone is on board. So here's what I'm trying to help you understand. When something is new, everybody's not going to be on the same page with you. Not everybody's going to embrace it. Well, that automatically means that somebody is going to buck the system. So while some will get on board, expect, here it is. Oh, that's good, Joy. Expect that some won't. Expect that everybody's not going to be happy about your promotion. Expect that everybody's not going to be happy that you found your boo and you're happily married. Expect not everybody's going to be happy about how you're growing in the Lord and you're changing. Now you're losing weight. And you decide to take care of yourself and make yourself pretty. Expect <laughs> the opposition. And so this number two says, when something is new, not everybody is on board. Well, let's look at verse 2 of Acts chapter 14 and see what the text can help us understand. Text says in verse 1 and 2, verse 2, now it happened in Iconium, that's where they went, right? That was the first verse, that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, watch this, both of the Jews and of the Greeks believe. Now, verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. I'm trying to tell you that there are people who are going to poison your first experience. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. There are people who don't get what God is doing in your life. And what they will do is try to poison your experience. Have you ever taken that one friend with you on the trip? You invited all your girlfriends and everybody said, oh, well, invite them. You know, you know how to invite them anyway. And they ruin the trip because they influenced other people with their negativity and their gossip. So while many believe, many others stir up trouble. But here is worth noting that the text said, even though people were poisoning, that both Jews and Greeks were believing. Ah, don't miss that that the goal was being accomplished, that what Paul and Barnabas went to do was to take the gospel to new people in a new territory. And the Bible said the Jews, here it is, and the Greeks were now believing. So was the mission being successful? Absolutely. So listen, newness takes a while. Oh man, this is good teaching. Newness takes a while to reach people. You don't just start something new and it automatically becomes an overnight sensation. It takes time to reach people. In other words, at the beginning, you are to expect opposition. But if you stay faithful at what you started, some of the many people 
people who were poisoning your situation convert to get on board with the city. Oh man, it's a first for you. And sometimes you can't even, you can't even believe you're about to do what you're going to do. So why would you get mad at other people for not believing? Some of the things that I've started is highly incredulous. And people have told me, man, you are crazy. You are out of your mind. I could barely believe it. So why get mad at people when they don't believe it? Here's what I'm saying to you, Lisa. Give people room to doubt. Oh yeah, there it is. Opposition is inevitable. But as long as the mission is being successful, keep doing it. As long as Greeks were believing, keep preaching, Paul. It doesn't matter who's poisoning, trying to poison the operation. Are you winning souls? Then keep winning souls. This leads us to point number three. I'm moving pretty fast, Tia. I'm moving pretty fast. Keep up, Lawanda. Check this out. Number three, if it's growing, keep doing it in spite of opposition. If it's growing, keep doing it in spite of opposition. These are good quotables. I hope you're taking pictures with your cell phone. Well, you can't do that because you're online. Well, all right, maybe not. Now, just write them down. Listen, if it's growing, keep doing it in spite of opposition. Now, let's look at verse, let's look at verse number three. The verse says, therefore, okay, we just read they went to Iconium. People got mad, tried to poison the situation. Verse three, therefore, they stayed there a long time. So look at that. They stayed there a long time doing what? Speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Watch this. Granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So how do you know that the journey is a success in spite of opposition. How do you know to stay at something and keep going? Ah, man, because transition is really about leaving one place to go to another. In other words, the end of a thing is the start of another. And if it's an experience you haven't experienced before, then you leave the familiar to start a first of what you're not familiar with. So how do you know that the journey is a success and you are to continue it in spite of the opposition? Why am I saying that? Because Paul and Bartimaeus could have said, well, they're hating on us here. They're trying to kill us. They're trying to, and how do you know? How do you know that this area is not for you? Well, there were two things that spoke to their success of the journey. And the text points it out. Text back on the screen, please. The text says, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, here it is, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. They were bearing witness to the word of his grace. So the preaching was working and granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So watch this. The fact that they were allowed to continue to preach confirmed that their message was of grace. In other words, God let them keep preaching. Watch this. If the opposition doesn't stop you, <laughs> keep doing it. Oh, man. Because oftentimes opposition is nothing but a threat. Oh, that's it, Joyce. Sometimes the enemy, all he does is bark, bark, bark. But won't a dog's bark create fear? I'll never forget, Joy and I were time spending out, sending out flyers for the <laughs> ministry, and we was walking the street deep, I'm saying deep in the hood. We were trying to put a church up over in, in, in the hood in LA, in the heart of LA, and the dog just started barking and Joy turned completely red. She was blood red. She was scared. She started took off running because the bark of the dog, dog couldn't get her, was behind the gate. And I'm telling you, there are a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, Joy, I tell you story. But the dog barking a lot of times is nothing but to create fear. If the opposition can't stop you, keep rolling, boo. If the opposition can't stop you, keep rolling rolling boo so they had continued with the gospel the fact that they could continue it meant that they were 
preaching the right message, even though some rejected it. God, listen to what I'm saying. Even though some disagree with you, it's not stopping you. So don't let the disagreements stop you from your first time experiences. Some people say, well, you know, Lord told me to do something. And then they talk to people and five other friends say, don't do it. Well, Listen, if there's nothing stopping you and you know God told you to do it, if he continues to give you the option to do it, then take that first. The second thing I noticed, not only that they were continued to do the gospel, but signs and wonders or miracles were done by their own hands. Look at the text. The text says, the text says that they were signs and wonders to be done by their own hands hands. In other words, it was visible and natural things that they were doing that confirmed the legitimacy of their ministry. In other words, so first of all, the fact that I can continue to do it is number one. That's how I know to stay. Number two, the fact that I have the power to do it. In other words, as long as I keep putting my hands to it, something keeps happening that keeps legitimizing the work that I'm, God, are you getting this? That God is saying, listen, two things. Listen, don't worry about the opposition. If th- Listen, don't worry about the opposition. Focus on whether or not you have the option to continue or whether or not you still have the power to do it. But here we go again. Look at verse number four. But look at that first word, but verse number four, but the multitude of the city was divided. I'd be doggone. Is there just not division everywhere? Listen, but the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part sided with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made, uh uh-oh, now it's escalated to a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews, haters on both sides. So the church people are not exempt. Haters on the both sides, Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to abuse and stone them. Verse six, they became aware of it. Oh, got that holy from God. And they fled. There it is. They fled. Listen to this. Now fleeing to Lystra and Derby. but notice this. Here's key cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding region. So notice they didn't leave Lyconia. They just went to another city. Ah, God, don't miss this. Let's get verse number seven. And they were preaching the gospel where? In Lystra and in Derby. So in other words, they went from Iconium to Lystra and Derby because a threat was posed to stop them from preaching. But look at verse seven. They just went to Lystra and Derby and did it there. So they created another first within the first. But here's what I want you to see. But even with such success as we saw in verse one, that the Jews and the Gentiles were believing, the city was still divided on how to support. You can do everything right, Terry. You can do everything right, Latanya. Somebody still ain't going to like what you're doing. Because sometimes, even though the hater in the beginning now becomes a supporter, sometimes the supporter in the beginning then becomes the hater. And so it becomes your closest inner circle that oftentimes starts out with you, but then things change. People change, people grow, or people retreat, they regress, either way, but they change. And the people you thought you could count on, you cannot anymore. And what I want you to see is that there's a division of support. And where there's a division of support, it affects your resources and your ability to do what God has called you to do. So there was a coordinated effort to capture and to stone them. So Paul and Barnabas heard of the plan and they fled to the cities of Lystra and Derby. But note, the opposition didn't cause them to quit. Did they say, we're about to be killed. Let's fold up the bag, put my sermon away, close up the laptop, 
I'm done with preaching. No, it just caused them to create another first by going to another city. And what I'm saying to you is, even though you're successful, continue to expect opposition. But if God has not caused you to, remember, it was just a threat. They heard the threat. It hadn't actually happened yet. And so until it stops you, keep doing what God has called you to do. So as verse 7 later tells us, they just start preaching in Lystra or Derby. If they don't want you at that job, go to another job and do it there. The difference is, listen, we too, we microscopically make a situation the tail end of our life. Stop being so committed to a single place of work. In other words, see your life as a career, as a career that can be done anywhere, not just focused on the place. God, man, listen to me. Listen, you are so locked in to one person and you think that this one person who broke your heart is the only person who's available to love you. Got news for you. More than 7 billion people in the world. Guarantee you there's another brother or another sister out there who will love you when the other person didn't. Don't get too isolated into a particular area. That's what I'm saying. The journey is real and heartbreak is real but heartbreak ain't stopped break. It doesn't mean that's what, that's all heartbreak is. Heartbreak is take a break from the heart, but get back pumping again. That's why it's heartbreak. It's not heart stop. Heart stop is a flat line. God didn't say get your heart a stop. He said your heart may be broken, but God is the healer of the heart and we continue to do what God has called us to do just with another person in another city at another job. You can't stop me. Is anybody getting what I'm saying? So it is my belief that the only time you stop doing something, and I'm talking about stop in the sense of journey. Journey is the action of moving forward. So I'm talking about actionizing and moving on a journey, traveling to do something versus stopping. That's why I keep saying the opposition comes to stop you, it means you no longer travel. It means you no longer take journeys. But it's my belief that the only time you stop doing something is, watch this, when there is no longer growth, when in other words, people aren't receiving what you're giving them and there is no longer power to do what you have been called to do. So I'll say that again, the only time you are to quit is when there is no longer growth in other words, after a significant period of time and effort of you doing and winning souls, and that's not happening anymore, and the fact that, number two, there are no more miracles occurring by your hand, then you might have to say, this journey is over. Are you getting what I'm saying? Maybe I should pause a little bit. Riri, what do you think, Riri? Should I keep going? Type on the line. Let me know. It's all ten based on Riri. Whatever <laughs> Riri say, I'll end it right now. If Riri, never mind. All right. So what do you do when the opposition relocates you temporarily? God, I don't want you to misinterpret opposition or relocation as an end to what God, oh man, this is so good. That relocation does doesn't mean that it's over. It just means that you're continuing the first experience in a new place. Well, let's take a look at this. Number four, when you can do the same thing somewhere else, your journey hasn't ended. When you can do the same thing somewhere else, your journey hasn't ended. So when opposition causes you to relocate, but your success there is just as great, if not better than where you left, then your journey is still intact. Well, listen to what I'm saying. So watch this. Your journey, though it may be long, may have many stops. When we drove on the highway to up to Sacramento or Frisco or wherever we we're going, we made many stops. And sometimes because of rain or because of construction, we had to take detours. But let me tell you something. We ain't never stopped at a rest stop and stayed there. We stopped and we got back on the road. And what I'm saying to you is that where you can still do the same thing that you were doing here, and if not even better in the new place, that's a sign that your journey hasn't ended. So when you get to the new place and you're still able to win souls, you're still able to do miracles. I'm keeping in the context 
context of Paul and Barnabas, but you put it in your own vernacular. People quit time and time again because of the opposition. But remember, it's not the opposition that should cause you to quit. Opposition is necessary. But what what would cause you to leave the journey is when you're no longer reaching people and you're no longer effective or potently laced with God's power. When you lose that, then you got a problem. I used to tell people all the time, and I told staff members who were transitioning, and I told people sometimes I had to terminate, bless their hearts. I said to them, listen, If you are gifted and skilled in an area, you can always make money. Why? Because your money is not limited to a place. You can go and do the same thing in another city that accommodates what you're gifted to do and you can make money over there. So you're crying because they fired you from here but you can go make the same amount of money, if not more, if you go polish up your resume and go to another city. The key is you continue your journey by continuing your purpose. You know you're on the right road when you know you're doing the right thing. Oh, I'm preaching. When you know that God is still giving you the answers you need, the response to what you're praying for, when he's answering what you're requesting, when he's providing for you to do what he's called you to do, keep doing it even if it goes from Iconium to Lystra. Are you tracking? Opposition is necessary, but what would cause you to not reach that is that if you're not growing and you lose the power. Look at verse number eight. Let's take a look at this passage. And in Lystra, a certain man, oh, watch this. So they come from Anconia, Iconium, and they go to Lystra, but they reach, they have a new first experience. Oh, I like this. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet, was crippled, was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Look at a first experience coming to give a first experience to a man who had never walked. Don't miss that, that the crippled man who's never walked is about to have a first experience. He's about to be able to start his missionary journey. But look at verse 9. This man heard Paul speaking. Uh, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. In other words, he believed it. And then verse 10 said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. So listen, when you can go somewhere else, and see the same miraculous power and the results of growth, then you're still part of the first movement. In other words, it's still working. And so Paul could have been depressed. They ran me out of Iconium. He could have been crying, Barnabas, what did we do wrong in Iconium? But instead, they witnessed God's power leading them to a new experience. They found the lame man, the crippled man, who had never walked before. And God said, because you were obedient, taking your first journey, I will give you the power to create first experiences for people who believe in what you bring. Oh, this is powerful. That when I do what God has called me to do, he gives me the power to empower other people who are afraid to take their first. My God, this is good. And so God says, don't be afraid of what you lost. In other words, those things have have run their course. Now you must look forward and ahead to the new experiences of which I have created for you. The text said that the crippled man did what? He believed. In other words, your power has power on those who believe. Stop spending your time trying to convince people who are rejecting what you have brought to the city. God says your power is potent to those who are willing to receive. If those of you online, right now I'm looking right in that camera, if those of you online took these messages that I've been preaching for this year all together about action, if you really, really believe them, I 
guarantee you, your life would be laced with effectiveness and impact and potency from the power of God. I cannot do what I do without the anointing of God. You cannot be excess- successful without the Holy Spirit of God on your life. So my point is, it didn't matter what city they were in. They were still seeing growth and demonstrating God's power. But too much growth, though, too much growth, Tia, can create a different perception of success. When you grow, it creates a different perception. And this is where people try to make their first journeys like other people's first journeys. Oh, watch this now. This gets good. Pay attention, Sean. Wendy, check in. Check in. Right here. This is for my professionals. Listen, there are experiences of success that people perceive in different ways. And so sometimes people like to make their first journey like other people's first journey. In other words, they spend their lives looking at other people's first journeys and trying to model their first journey after somebody else. You know what I'm talking about. You on Instagram, you on Facebook, you on TikTok, and you're looking at how other people live, and you say, I'm going to do it like they did it. Your first is your first. Tap your neighbor, type it on the line, tell them, your first is your first. It's not anybody else's first. God designed firsts for you. That's why it's a first. It's a first for you. God is not giving you a life to be a duplication of something someone else's. God uses extraordinary people. In other words, he creates these original designs in you. The Bible says we are a masterpiece created in the hands of the potter to do great works. But don't let people try to make you like others. Let me put it like this. Watch this now. Don't let success go to your head. Stop people from making you into a deity. There are a lot of people who tend to think that because of the success in my life, I'm better than you somehow. Perception is everything, but often perceptions shift so from person to person that the truth can be lost. Uh, watch this. Because we have this image presented on Facebook or social media, we lose the truth because we're our perception of people is flawed. Perception can sometimes be misconstrued as people's opinion. I'm going to say that again. A perception can sometimes be misconstrued as just somebody's opinion. And someone's opinion is not always the truth because perception could be rendered as, well, that's how I see it. In other words, somebody could say, that's how I see it, meaning that's my opinion. But don't let your perception of a place or a person keep you from the journey being real for you. Oh, come on. Just because you perceived it a certain way for somebody else, you're afraid to embark on your journey because of what happened to them. And then you start thinking iconically yourself that you're above opposition and you're above trouble and you got money and you think you can navigate through the turmoils and the strategies of the devil. The Lord will lead you right to the trap (laughs) because God wants you to see he has the power to deliver you. Now watch this. Don't let the perception lead you into thinking that you can't take this journey. And this is what is meant by my title, The Journey is Real. First time experiences that are great can go to your head. They can be a danger to how you see yourself on subsequent journeys. You begin to think that every journey after this one will be like the first. In other words, that's the trouble with first journeys. You have so much fun. Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, this relationship is, you know how people, they they first meet and they're all over Facebook. Oh, I met my man. I met my man. And then they go quiet and you be like, oh, check the relationship status. Single again. We broke up. Never mind. In other words, you start thinking 
that every first experience duplicates itself. No, it's a first experience because the first experience brings new experiences that are unlike anything else. So let me be self-humiliating for a moment. I'm going to put myself on the block. I apologize to myself. Because, watch this, because, don't laugh at me. I'm sorry, don't, don't laugh at me. I'm trying, I'm trying to do this right straight. No, don't laugh at me. Don't judge me. This is my own issues. This is where I was, okay? Don't, ju don't judge me. Don't put it online. Because my first first encounters with dates was so successful, I began to believe that I would always have that success. I was thinking, oh boy, you got it. So when I first got my heart broke though, I was devastated because I had allowed myself and others' words to make me think that I was somebody special, that I was in essence a dating deity. Oh, <laughs> let's hear how God put it. I'm gonna just run right on past that get on off of me. Verse 11 says it like this. He says, now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. They gave them God names. Verse 13, then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitude. They're about to give sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude and crying out saying, men, why are you doing this thing? No, we also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from the useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them. Look at him, he's preaching still. Who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. I listen to this sermon. This is good. Verse 18, and with this, these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. In other words, the preaching got so good, they could scarcely stop them from sacrificing. What I'm trying to say to you is don't let success go to your head. You sometimes, God is blessing you and you have to stop people from making you an icon or a deity. Why do you have to stop them? Because people will begin to think that they can do life like you do life. My life is my life. Your life is your life. I'm not trying to be T.D. Jakes. I'm not trying to be Beyonce. I'm not trying to be Bishop Noel Jones. I'm trying to be me and you should be trying to be you. Don't elevate these preachers. Don't elevate your boss. Don't elevate your spouse into a deity. They are human just like you and you should not fear the first in your life based on what happened to them. You cannot face life with triggers that cause you to be afraid because of traumatic experiences in the past. Let the past fizzle out and let God give you new reign and new territory. They called Barnabas Jupiter, and they called him Zeus, or Paul Mercurius, or Hermes, and they were preparing to make sacrifices unto them. Paul and Barnabas stopped them and said, man, we just people like you. The point of this section is that fame isn't what makes you successful. Many horrible people are made into icons. You hear me? Fame is not the register for knowing that you're on the right journey. Just because people applaud you and elevate you doesn't mean they believe in you. God, this is what I'm saying. Measure the success of your first by the growth in the hearts of people and the power with which you have to do your job. But lo and behold, even with the success in another city, opposition arises yet again. And this is why I tell people no matter where you go, there will be opposition to what you do and who you are wherever you're doing it. Look at these final texts as we begin to wrap it up. I'm bringing it on home. 19 says, then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there Oh, wait a minute. The people who threatened them, they came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the multitudes, uh-oh, first it was a threat, second it ran them out, but here it is, they finally got them. 
They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. In other words, they thought he was dead. They left him on the tracks and said, you done in this city. However, when the disciples gathered around him, uh oh, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas, where? To Derby. <laughs> Iconium with the threat. Lystra would have beat down. Derby <laughs> was a new city. <laughs> uh, but look at verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, so notice, still able to make disciples, still got the power, they returned back to <laughs> look at this. <laughs> this is insane they go back to Lystra where they got beat they go back to Iconium and they go back to Antioch why <laughs> look at 22 to strengthen the souls of the disciples that they made when they were there, hallelujah, exhorting them to do what? Look at the word, continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of the almighty God. Who? If you don't get this passage, you're missing the point. Here again in another city, opposition arose again. And this time they would be successful in stoning Paul. They stoned him and they left him for dead. Just because people are hating, the question to ask is, are you still being successful? Are you accomplishing what God has asked you to do? Even if it, they are, if it's yes, then you continue with your first. Why? Because the journey is still real. Somebody say the journey is still real, which leads me to my final point for today. The final point is God will surround you with people who can lift you up after you have been beaten down. God's job is to surround you with people who will lift you up after you have been beaten down. If your first journey is of God, he will surround you with people who are there to lift you up. Even though you've been beaten down and I'm telling you your opposition doesn't always know who's around you to help you I was in a situation this week where I was a guest somewhere and as a guest we had unknown security in other words we had security making sure we were okay but you don't announce security you don't let people know who's protecting you and so what God did he allowed the, the Paul and Barnabas to be surrounded with people. Your help will kick in when you need them. You may not see them. They're not, they're not obvious. They aren't real up front, but they're flanking you left and right. God has angels inside and out. God has people in your life who are ready to help you up when life is beating you down. The scripture said that Paul and Barnabas were there after being bitten down. I don't know why they, the text say they didn't bother Barnabas. I guess they beat Paul because Paul was the main preacher. So be careful. If you're the one talking, you're the one going to get beat up. But the Bible said that the disciples stood surrounding Paul while he laid there for dead. And that gave me comfort that in your dying situation, you're always surrounded. Paul was surrounded with help. And why are they there? Why do we have help there? To lift you up so you can continue what you're doing. God doesn't leave you for dead because if you can't get up, you can't journey. God wants us healed. God wants us well. Whenever we are living for him and trying his journeys, he will lift us up. So the text says, after Paul healed, he and Barnabas went back to Iconium to make the disciples, to encourage them, to, to make sure the converts on the first journey were okay. They knew the job wasn't done just by being there the first time. Some of you think just because I went that's enough. No, you got to go and finish the job. Tap somebody on the line and say, finish the job. They knew their job wasn't done and they knew it wasn't complete until there were people who could duplicate what they had done. The goal of knowing that you're finished where you are is if you can duplicate it from somebody else. Never leave the business unless you develop a successor who can run the company while you're away from the company. Away with these 
these one time socialites who raise up these astronomers build uh, uh, businesses uh, big businesses and don't leave anybody who can run them so they fold after six months but God has designed our lives to be a treatment to other people a salve unto other people's wounds and bandages to where we help people get up from their misery and their struggles and people who couldn't take journeys can now take journeys again and we must stay long enough to make sure they walk in other words stay long enough to make sure the bandage is healed stay long enough to make sure the bleeding is stopped stay long enough to make sure they feel comfortable behind the desk God says your journey isn't over until you're able to duplicate your experience with God so don't leave your first until you've done everything possible to give people the opportunity to do and experience what you have when you have created the cycle of the circle I call it let me say it to you when you've done everything you can to create the cycle of the circle in other words a cycle that keeps the circle going then you can remove yourself from it and begin a new first on your second journey Paul had four missionary journeys in the book of Acts and the second journey didn't start until he was finished with the first so he went back to Iconium he went back to Lystra he went back to Antioch he went back to where he started to finish the job because he couldn't start his second journey until he finished the first oh my god I conclude with these practical thoughts today this is thought number one Opposition shouldn't stop you. Lack of growth and power should. Opposition, we said, shouldn't stop you. Lack of growth and miracles should. Verse 22 says, we can only enter the kingdom of God by passing through much tribulation. Listen to what I'm saying. You can only enter the kingdom of God. The text said, by passing through much tribulation. You got to go through it. And don't let the experience, don't let the opposition on the journey learn how to drive in the rain. Learn how to sit with faith through the turbulence on the plane. Learn how to get through the hail, the sleet, and the snow. Learn that if God called you, he'll be with you to make it to your destination. You can't stop just because there's trouble. Secondly, adapt to the newness of things. You gotta learn to adapt to the newness of things. Don't try to fit what's new into an old mold. In other words, once you get to the new place, don't try Try to make the new place like your old place. Adapt. To the new place. When me and Joy went to Miami and we was walking on South Beach, we had to adapt to the heat in Miami. So we was walking around in bikinis and no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm just kidding. But we had on our colorful shirts. We had on our sandals and our flip flops. We thought we was Miami Vice. I forget their names, the two guys. And they was in, we were in Miami. In other words, we adapted to the new place. Change, listen, they changed the message to fit the audience and if you notice you go back and read the text when usually Paul was talking about Jesus and the gospel he talked about the Old Testament he talked about the prophets well these people these Greeks didn't know about, about the Old Testament about the prophets so what was his sermon about his sermon was about God gives rain and God gives love and God does this in other words he had to talk to the Greeks in their own language you can't go into the corporate world talking to people praise the Lord hallelujah but you ain't in church shut up this is a board meeting this is a business what's wrong with you you got to adapt to the new cat dog it come on if you're gonna try something new you've got to study what that is I remember when I used to start new ventures or I had a new project I would study the background I would look it up on the internet I would get familiar with the culture and the experience because I knew I had to adapt to what was going on they spoke of what God was to them let me move on here it is sometimes even the right message can and get you stoned. I don't even have an explanation on that one. That says just what it says. Sometimes even the right message can get you stoned. No matter how you say it, no matter what you do, people just don't like it because the message is true and it's cutting them. Next message. Go to where new is. Newness keeps moving. Let me talk to you. Go to where new is. Why? Because newness keeps moving. Put me on screen. Do you see? Listen. Newness is moving. There. Newness is moving. New, look at Newness just moved. Where you got to go where the newness is. Wait a minute. Newness just moved again. In other words, I've got to keep my 
my life moving because newness keeps moving. The Bible said, go where the audience is. Paul went to Iconium, kicked him out of Iconium, went to Lystra. Lystra went to Derby. Went to Derby, then had to go back to Iconium. We went back to Lystra. In other words, go where the newness is. The Spirit of God is flowing and you must find it. Next one, reproduce your experience and others younger than you. Reproduce your experience and others younger than you. In other words, deposit the realness of your journey and others who can reproduce what you started with their kids. In other words, my mama used to take us, we'd go on trips, mama used to take us, we'd all go or whatever, and we would watch our parents. In other words, we're watching to observe so that when I grow up and get married, I know how to take my kids on trips. I know how, in other words, mama reproduced in me the likeness of God and what we do on trips. Establish converts. Let them spread your message. In other words, create subgroups that will continue the leadership of your calls even when you're away. You know you've had impact someplace when the work you've done starts reproducing itself and it no longer needs you. I love the quote. I keep saying it. You know it all the time. Nanny McPhee. When you need me, basically, I'll stay. When you need me but don't want me, I have to stay. But when you want me but no longer need me, I have to go. Work your life in a way to where people don't need you anymore, but they want you. Oh my God. And so many people brag about how they need me. Oh, they need me. That's no testimony. That means you're an enabler. If you've been in somebody's life for all these years and they still need you like day one and you in year 20, you're an enabler. Your life should change people enough to where they say, thank you, but I no longer need you because those people you're enabling are keeping you from your next journey. I conclude with this last one. Give yourself and others at least one opportunity to experience what's new. In other words, give people as many as possible at least one opportunity to experience your message. What do I mean by that? Go somewhere new enough to where new people get to hear your message at least once. Stop regurgitating the same message to the same people the same way. Give as many people as possible a chance to hear your message for the first time. I met some new people this week and I realized they asked me, what's your name? And what they were saying, I don't know you. I was meeting someone for the first time. Give people a chance to hear your name for the first time. And it took me so back because it hadn't happened so long because I've been around most of the people who know who I am. I don't say my name. But it took me so back. What was the first thing they said? What, what did you say? I said, Cherry. Jerry? No, Cherry. Sherry? No, Cherry. Just like the fruit. Like the fruit? You spell it the same way? C-H-E? Yes, Cherry, just like the fruit. In other words, the same thing happened back when I was in high school and college People couldn't realize that my name was Cherry and it reminded me the fact that they struggled to get it meant that I was meeting someone again for the first time. Your journey like Paul's could begin today. I leave you with this text. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Look, at they left Iconia. They left, look, they own their way. They, they own the journey. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Hallelujah. 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 
Don't you want to be commended to God for the work you've completed? When they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. That was the mission. That was the goal. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This could be you. Blazing new trails, making new impact. But you can't have multiple journeys if you don't have the first. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first journey is real. The first journey often scars you. The first journey, it scares you. The first journey, you're not expecting to be stoned. And Paul said later in the, in the New Testament, he said, I bear the scars. I bear the marks in my body of preaching Christ. Have you ever had a first journey where you've taken the hit and you have the scars to prove it? Your first journey is real. And I won't say your first journey is your best journey because I've learned things from my first journey that have made my subsequent journeys just like heaven. In other words, the first journey, I don't ever want to take that again, but I've learned enough from it to know that the journey I'm on now I wouldn't trade it for a lifetime. I'm on a journey now, and this journey is unlike any other. Are you ready for action? If so, then face your firsts and give God the opportunity to use you in the midst of and in spite of your opposition. This has been, the journey is real, the power of the firsts. I'm PC, and that's all I've got.